welcome to Cumberland Conversations. I'm Sally Shutt, Cumberland County's Public Information Director. This month's conversation looks at the Cumberland County Animal Control. Our guests are Animal Control Director Dr. John Lobby and Jennifer Hutchison Tracy. Dr. Lobby, thank you so much for being here. Tell us a little bit about the mission of Cumberland County Animal Control. Uh, the mission of Cumberland County Animal Control is uh, to uh, ensure that we provide a protective barrier for rabies uh, between, the, uh, between the wildlife population, uh, the pets, and the, and the owners of the animals. That's the, our main mission. Our secondary missions are to promote respects, uh, responsible pet ownership and um, also to educate uh, the public uh, on requirements for licensing and rabies vaccinations. Plus, uh, we want to uh, educate our students, uh, try to get them at a younger age to ensure that uh, they grow up into being responsible pet ownerships. Um, now, Dr. Lobby, how long have you been with animal control? Uh, I started in June of 2010. And, but you had had some experience before uh, with yeah. the department, right? Yeah, I, I actually worked with the, uh, the department as an advisor and a veterinarian. I, I had 30 years in practice in Cumberland County as a veterinarian. And then uh, uh, um, I was involved in starting the Animal Control Board, plus uh, uh, I was also uh, involved in doing uh, medical care uh, on request from the uh, shelter personnel. Now, Jennifer, you're the shelter manager there. Yep. So tell us about how you became, uh, uh, how long you've been with animal control. And I've been with Cumberland County for almost four years. I started out as a shelter attendant, but I'd been at two other agencies before. So I brought in some perspective from seeing things in other places. And through the years in animal control, what, do you, what have you found to be one of those, or some of the misconceptions the public has about the mission of animal control, what you guys are doing out there? We, we get two different extremes. We get the people that don't feel like we're doing enough, and then we get the people that think we're just out there wanting to pick up their dogs so we can collect fines. Mm -hmm. And neither of which is the case. We're doing as much as we can with the laws as they are written. And as far as collecting fines, we would, our officers would just as soon teach people to be more responsible owners and keep their animals than bring them into the shelter. And you mentioned the laws. and. Let's talk a little bit about rabies. I guess we can't emphasize enough the importance mm -hmm. of pet owners having their pets vaccinated, <clears throat> Dr. Yeah. Lobby. Yeah. Uh, North Carolina has a general statute, 130A-185, that states all animals over, all dogs and cats and ferrets over four months of age are required by law to be vaccinated. It's a misconception, a common misconception that, that people don't, don't have to vaccinate their animals until they're six months old, or they don't have to get their vaccinations until they're six months old. But the law actually states that they have to be vaccinated by four months. Uh, even a lot of veterinarians don't understand that completely because they think you can't vaccinate a puppy till it's four months old, but you actually uh, can vaccinate for rabies between three months and four months of age. And then is it an annual vaccine? Uh, we have uh, uh, one-year vaccines, three-year vaccines, and there are some five-year vaccines that are coming out uh, uh, today. So we have a, a variety of vaccines that are available to the public. Okay. Now, Jennifer, how many cases of rabies did we have in the county in 2013? We had 17 confirmed and suspected cases. It yeah. was a busy year. A busy year, and, and there were some unique, I mean, uh, some of those were bats, weren't they? Uh, the majority of them were, at least half, I would say, were bats. Um, we sent off probably a total of 100 samples, 50 of which were bats. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if that if I can explain the, the, our parameters for testing bats are a little broader than they are for some of the other animals because you can be exposed to a bat without knowing it if it's in your home when you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you get in a tangle with a raccoon, you're generally gonna know it. Mm -hmm. um, so of those 50 that we sent, I think eight or nine of them did come back positive or suspected positive. Now, Dr. Lobby, can you explain the process when you do get the department receive notification from the state lab that we do have a positive case? Yes. Uh, animal control has a responsibility of notifying the public and educating the public when a positive case of rabies is, is 
located in anywhere in our county. So uh, what we do is we gather uh, several animal control officers, we print flyers, and we actually go up and down the streets uh, in about a three to a four block area around where we found the, the positive rabies case and actually put flyers on people's uh, mailboxes or on, on their doors stating that there was a positive rabies in the area. They need to be aware of the problems that, uh, that if their animal is exposed to a, a rabid animal without an up-to-date vaccination that, that the animal will be required to have a six-month quarantine or, or euthanasia. So uh, there are some significant problems that happen uh, if you don't get your animal vaccinated. And one of the other things we do is we send out press releases and oh, the local yes. media have been yeah. great to get those yeah. out and put them on yeah. the newspapers yeah. and radio. Yeah, we send it to you and you send it out for <laughs> us, but thank you very much. Yeah. Um, now, Dr. Lobby, let's talk a little bit about in April when the county helped sponsor some <laughs> rabies clinics. Right. We have, uh, uh, every, in every April for the 30 years that I've been practicing medicine in the county and and uh, providing rabies vaccinations for our, our citizens. We've had uh, rabies clinics uh, in the month of April. We hold them every Tuesday and Thursday from 4 to 6 p.m. At, at three different locations. We try to spread the locations around the county so that we'll have uh, um, people in the rural areas, areas have an opportunity to get their pets in and get them, get them vaccinated for um, uh, ten, the, the rabies vaccines are about $10 a piece. So, um, and we're averaging about 2,300 vaccines at these during the month of April at these rabies clinics. So uh, we'd like to see a lot more, but uh, we are getting a lot of those that can't get their animals into a, a veterinary clinic. We're getting them vaccinated and protected against rabies. Great. Let's see, in 2013, Animal Control started a new mm -hmm. initiative, and mm -hmm. that is that you are now administering and collecting the pet licensing. Yes. So could you give us a little bit of background about how okay. this change came about? Well, um, I've, been, uh, uh, I've been trying to get this process uh, going in the county for a number of years, but uh, the reason that we needed to do this was, for instance, in 2011, we had um, 35,000 animals vaccinated for rabies in Cumberland County. Correction, we had 35,000 animals licensed for rabies. Of those 35,000, we had 21,000 that did not have rabies vaccinations. That meant that that's 60 percent of the animals that are licensed do not have up-to-date rabies vaccinations. The tax administration had no method or no way to get out and check with the public and ensure that their animals are being vaccinated. That's really animal control's responsibility and, and um, I felt it was necessary that we're, we're in charge of that and we handle that because it put uh, uh, an extreme uh, strain on tax administration trying to uh, uh, issue 35,000 uh, county tags uh, during a one week period uh, in, in the month of I think it was March or April. But so. Um, Showing that we only have, we had such a small number of animals that are vaccinated for rabies that we, we need, in animal enforcement needed to get involved in the process of, of ensuring that these people are vaccinating their pets because everybody lives near a rabies vector. Everywhere in the county, mm -hmm. in the city, we have raccoons, we have foxes, we have bats, we have coyotes. We have all these things that are that are exposing our pets to rabies. And if you let your dog out of your home and it runs into the woods and then comes back, you won't know if it's been exposed. If it's not been vaccinated, you're not going to get protected. Mm -hmm. And the sad reality is uh, when we started this program, uh, there were 0.8% uh, of the cats in Cumberland County were vaccinated and licensed for rabies, and 4.4% of the dogs only out of, out of the total 200,000 animals we have in the county. So right now, um, we are about seven months into this process, and we now have 4.7% uh, of the cats, which is about 4,000, mm -hmm. and um, 17% of the dogs, which is about uh, 21,000, that are now licensed and vaccinated for rabies. So we've increased that number 
uh, about 400 percent to 600 percent in less than a year. And our, our goals are to get 70 percent of the animals vaccinated in the county, uh, vaccinated and licensed. Understanding that the licensing fee that you pay for your pet, that money comes directly back to animal control so that we can get better equipment, better care for the animals, better able to medicate the animals and to actually get more officers out on the road to answer the calls of the citizens. Mm -hmm. As, uh, our, one, of the, one of the missions I didn't mention was our job is to protect and serve the animals and the citizens of our county. So we need to have uh, officers on the road when the people need them to and be able to get there in a short period of time. Well, Jennifer, tell us, give us the specifics about the license, how much they cost, and, and how citizens can go about um, paying for and getting those licenses. Okay. Well, the licenses are $7 if your animal is fixed, $25 for an animal that has not been fixed. Um, you can purchase them at the shelter. Some of the vets are selling them for us. You can purchase them online, mail-ins. We're, we're mailing out bills for licensing. So there's lots of different options. and. If you have questions, because a lot of people have been, that's what we're here for is to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, has the process gone smoothly, Dr. Lobby? I'm sorry. With, has the process gone smoothly with animal control um, um, now? It's, it's, it's smooth in, in the, way that we're, the way that we're running it. It has gone smoothly. It's been difficult for my staff, all my admin staff. Uh, we have five women that are answering telephones. And of course, when you send out 35,000 bills and people have questions about them and you get 5,000 phone calls and you have mm -hmm. five, and within a week's time you have five people to answer that, it really, it put a real strain on our, on our girls, but we struggled through it the first few, the first few times that we've done this and, and the process is going more smoothly every time we're doing it. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for this information. We're going to take a break right now, and when we come back, we're going to talk about adoptions and some of the other programs that are going on in animal control. Okay. We're going to take a break right now, and we ask that you uh, join us again in just a few moments. Welcome back as we continue our look at animal control. We're joined by Dr. John Lobby, our animal control director in Cumberland County, and Jennifer Hutchison Tracy, who is the shelter manager at Animal Control. Dr. Lobby, let's talk a little bit about shelter operations and tell us where the shelter is located. Okay, the shelter is located south of the uh, Crown Coliseum between uh, Business 95 and Interstate 95, or Business 95 and Highway 87. So uh, you can, uh, it's uh, just off of Tom Starling Road, so you can either go south on 87 uh, or uh, south on Business 95 and turn on Tom Starling Road and we're about located about halfway between uh, 87 and, and uh, uh, Business 301. Okay. Well, Jennifer, tell us how many animals come through the shelter every year? Every year, roughly 13 to 15,000. Last year we were just under 14,000. So can you explain how, you know, monthly, so that's why just over 1,000 coming through every 11, 1,200 along those lines, about 40, 50 a day. And how do they arrive at the shelter? The majority of them do come in as strays, particularly with cats. I'd say for every one owner surrender, there's probably four stray cats. Mm -hmm. Dogs, it's a little more closely matched. Uh, there's probably two-thirds are, are strays, one-third is owner surrender from the statistics from last year anyway. And then we have others that come in for different situations, cruelty investigations, dangerous dog investigation, bite quarantines, and odd, odd little situational things like that. But okay. the majority are owner surrender strays. Okay. Well, um, when an owner surrenders, what, I mean, how do they just bring the animal in? How does that work? Pretty much. Uh, they bring the animal in, hopefully with some sort of vet records or some sort of information mm -hmm. about the animal. If they have proof of ownership and they sign the animal over to us, it immediately becomes our property and then can go immediately to adoption. If it's not suitable for adoption, unfortunately, it can immediately be euthanized. 
Well, Dr. Lobby, could you maybe give us some um, insight into why we have such a large number of animals coming through the shelter? Um, we, we've had this terrible problem for the 30, 35 years I've been in the county uh, where they're picking up about a thousand animals a month, um, every month. And it, it's primarily caused from irresponsible pet owners uh, not spaying and neutering their animals. So you're having a lot of reproduction, a lot of strays. We have people, we have a lot of people moving in and out of the county and some people can take their animals with them. So, uh, some people can't so, uh, and they abandon the animals and, and sometimes they just get away. They're, they're, um, they're rambunctious and playful and somebody will open a gate or a door and a dog that's normally not loose in the county gets loose and um, evident eventually we end up picking up the animals and and bringing them into the shelter and uh, then as it comes through the shelter uh, we go through the process of determining whether or not they're adoptable and and ho our goal is to adopt every animal that is adoptable. So Jennifer kind of walk us through um, how the animals are processed into the shelter and, and what takes place there. Well, every animal that comes to the shelter is going to go through our processing room, whether they come in from an officer or from the front door. They're going to go in there and they're going to be evaluated for health, behavior. We're going to give them some basic vaccinations, deworming. If there's some other minor medical stuff we can take of that care of, then we will. From that point, they're either, if they're a stray, they're put into a holding situation. If they don't have any kind of identification, it's a three business day hold. If they have identification, we're going to make every attempt to contact the owner and hold the animal for 10 business days. Once that stray hold is over, they become our property and then they will make the move over to adoption, rescue, or euthanasia if they're not suitable for adoption. Okay, um, you, if, if a pet does have proper ID, talk a little bit about microchipping because yes. that's one of the ways that you can ID the pet. A microchip is a wonderful thing to have if you use it correctly. It's only as good as the information in the database. So we do scan every animal that comes in for a microchip. They're scanned a couple more times in the process of being in the shelter. So um, if, when, if and when we find that microchip, we will call the database, find out their information. And the biggest failing of the microchip is either it's not been registered with the database or the information hasn't been updated. So, you know, if all that information is good and we can make that reunion with the owner, it's certainly a happy ending for everybody that what time, when that happens. And you've had some recent reunions at yes. the shelter. Yes, we've had some that had been away from their pets for several years. And uh, it was all pretty dramatic. We had one, um, the people that brought it in had surren were surrendering the dog because of the old age and hip problems. We found the microchip and called the database and it was somebody totally different and we called that number it was still good they were in the sh shelter within an hour or two to come get poor old girl a little black lab mix yeah they were very very excited and the oh, other yeah. one had been a couple of years that the dog had been missing lost during a home burglary yeah well now jennifer mentioned dr lobby euthanasia and mm -hmm. so if you could explain to our viewers mm -hmm. why our county shelter cannot be a no-kill shelter mm -hmm. Well, um, there's a couple of reasons that, that um, we can't be uh, classified as a no-kill shelter. We have to take all the animals that come in from the county, whether they're, whether they're turned in uh, through uh, uh, over-the-counter stuff or whether they're brought in uh, by uh, an animal control officer. Some of those animals are sick. Some of them have diseases that, that uh, can't be treated. Some of them are aggressive animals that uh, either have attacked somebody or have attacked another animal. And the county is responsible uh, to, uh, it's our responsibility to ensure that what we do take in is adoptable. And we do, uh, Jennifer and her staff go to extraordinary means to ensure that we can get an animal adopted. Um, sometimes we, we do a, a um, testing when they first come in on behavior um, and if they don't pass that test that, that doesn't mean we just stop dealing with them. We also have people that will come in and work with these animals if they're if they're a type of animal that we think may be adopted so that we can try to get them um, to because so, n none of them want to be in our shelter. 
Okay. So when they do get there, a lot of times their temperament is different than what it is when, when they would be outside or by themselves or something like that. So we make every effort to go on uh, uh, to get to ensure that if there's any way possible an animal that is adoptable gets onto our adoption line and gets to be viewed by the public and adopted. Um, we also have to take in uh, all the animals, all the shelters in the county that are, are class, call themselves no-kill shelters. They have a limit to the number of animals they can take in. Okay, Cumberland County, our shelter cannot limit the animals. If they're called or they're brought in, we have to take them. So all those animals that go to these no-kill shelters, uh, if they're full, which they are most of the time, they refer those people to us and we have to deal with them. So it's a, it's a terrible thing that we have to euthanize healthy animals, but when you're bringing in 100 dog and cats a day, every day, and your shelter only holds 300 animals, we have to make decisions. And unfortunately, Jennifer has to make that decision uh, on which animals stay and which animals go. And it's a terrible thing that we have to do, but this is a problem caused by irresponsible dog owners. And we are paid by Cumberland County citizens to take care of that problem mm -hmm. for us. Well, fortunately, adoption rights have gone up mm -hmm. in the county to all of your efforts, so mm -hmm. we're very fortunate for that. Jennifer, explain the adoption process for our viewers out there who might be interested in, in bringing home a new pet. Well, our shelter is available or open for adoptions Monday through Friday, 9 to 5.30, and Saturday is 1 to 5. You can preview the adoptable animals on the, on the county website or um, through PetHarbor.com following prompts. When you come in, you'll be taken through the shelter with a shelter attendant or volunteer. If you see an animal that you like, we'll get you in a bonding room so you can interact with them or out in one of our play yards. And once you've decided that's the perfect one, there's some fees to pay and some paperwork to do. In most cases, the animal has not yet been sterilized, so it will stay with us till the next business day. We'll transport it to the vet. It'll have its spay neuter surgery and the new adopter picks it up from the vet. Now, another thing that you're doing in animal control is you're going out and taking adoptable pets to other locations. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of that outreach. Who Jennifer. is that addressed to? Okay. Hey, and Jennifer. <laughs> We've done several adoption events this past year that have been very, very successful. Uh, PetSmart Charities has invited us to several mm -hmm. of theirs. We've done some with Walmart. Uh, a couple other groups have asked us to take part with adoption events. Highly successful. They reach a group of adopters that may be intimidated by coming to the shelter or just are so big hearted they just don't want to see the animals in that setting. And it's that way for some people. Um, and it just it gets us out there where the people that may not even be aware that we exist and we have animals available for adoption that makes them aware of that we're there and we've got cute friendly happy animals mm -hmm. that need homes. Well Dr. Lavi you mentioned uh, volunteers working and helping mm -hmm. to socialize the animals so tell us about some other volunteer opportunities through animal control. Yeah. Um, we have a huge need for volunteers at, at animal control. Uh, we need people that that can bathe and groove animals, people that know uh, have obedience experience so that they can uh, help us. Uh, if we have an animal that's not lead trained, for, for instance, uh, they can do some uh, lead work with them, sit down, stay, things like that. So we're trying to do everything possible to make the animals that we have in our shelter adoptable. With, uh, we get them clean, we try to keep get them uh, free of any diseases, communicable diseases. Uh, we get them um, free of fleas and ticks and things like that and, and uh, groom them if they've been gone and they're in the woods for a while. Their, hair, their coats are really not in good shape so we have, we have um, grooming uh, areas that we can bathe and clean them up and do everything possible to make them more presentable. Uh, it's, a, it's really, uh, for us, the most rewarding thing is getting them out the, getting them adopted and getting them into a home where they're going to get love and affection and, and comfort in the things that these animals that we, that we all love uh, get them treated properly. And Jennifer, where can you go to learn more information about volunteering? What do you have to do to become a volunteer? We hold a volunteer orientation at the shelter on the third Saturday of every month at 10 a.m. That is also followed by a foster orientation at 2 p.m. And that's just a, a 
it usually takes about an hour, an hour and a half. You sit down with our rescue coordinator, volunteer, foster. She wears a lot of hats and chalker, and she'll go through the do's and the don'ts and the cans and the can'ts of volunteering. It's really pretty flexible being a volunteer with us. We don't commit you to a certain number of hours or days or anything mm -hmm. like that. You bring your skills, talents, and time. We're grateful for whatever you can do. We have volunteers. I have one lady that comes in most every morning. All she does is do laundry and brush some cats while she's waiting on loads. But it helps. It helps us. It helps the cats. And she, yeah. she decides to do that when well, that's what works for her. Okay. Well, Dr. Lobby, as our time is drawing to an end here, I guess, could you tell me just uh, how rewarding you find your job in animal control and, and what you enjoy most about it? Uh, I think the most enjoyable thing is to uh, see the changes that we've made in animal control and the image that we've changed to where animal control people now are here to protect and serve the public. And uh, we're paid by taxpayer dollars and everybody knows uh, our job is, is to help the animals and to protect the public, uh, to protect the animals, uh, to ensure responsible pet ownerships. and it's. Uh, um, it's, it's, I'm thankful that I've been given the opportunity to do this. There, there, there are not many qualified people that have, have been able to get into these types of positions where uh, I can take care of the animals both medically, uh, t um, take care of this, uh, help the staff become better uh, uh, educated to properly serve the county and serve the citizens of our county. Thank you so much for being here today and, and telling our viewers about animal control. Our time is up for now. I want to thank our guests for joining us and educating us on animal control and the ongoing initiatives to increase pet adoptions and promote responsible pet ownership. Thank you for sitting in on our conversation. If you have any questions about today's topic, please contact Cumberland County Animal Control at 910 321 We hope you will join us for future Cumberland Conversations. You can learn more about what's happening in Cumberland County Government by visiting our website or Facebook page. We also hope you will consider enrolling in our Citizens Academy, which is offered twice each year.